Okay, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. I think we still have a few coming inside, but uh, we can get going because uh, I don't want to keep you guys uh, from lunch too long. So uh, I'll call our next set of panelists up on the stage. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, overall uh, visions from our CEOs, from our Post and CC members. Uh, and then this afternoon, we dive into the strategies. So uh, we're going to switch topics now. We're going to talk about uh, diversification. We have Semyon Pak from Kazakh Post, uh, Manager Director, Managing Director of International Business. Uh, Nomkita Mona, CEO of South African Post. Mariela Busan, CEO of Seychelles Post. And Nermin Hassan, Head of International Cooperation Sector for Egypt Post and the Chairperson for the Postal Union for the Mediterranean. So uh, if you'll join me in welcoming our panelists this morning. Okay, that's for you. So uh, we're going to talk about diversification this morning and I uh, just want to hear a little bit from each of you on uh, your overall vision when it comes to diversification in your post. Um, Semyon, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, diversification with Kazakh Post? Are you concentrating more on diversifying when it comes to the core business and what you're doing in delivery or completely new competencies? Sure. Well, thank you, Amanda. And uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the organizers for such an incredible event. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, just a brief answer to your question. Uh, yes, we're trying to stick to the core businesses that we do, but amend with the uh, new business opportunities which and follow the market trends which the, again, commercial market is offering. So my name is Simeon Park. I'm the deputy CEO responsible for the international business at Cus Post. Today, I'd like to briefly talk about our diversification strategies. <clears throat> so we are a national operator in Kazakhstan. We have the high level of brand recognition because of our physical presence across the country. We are the only operator who is offering the entire uh, coverage of, the, of Kazakhstan. We deliver it to the most remote areas in the country. We have almost 3,000 uh, postal branches, uh, over 18,000 employees, 2,000 transportation units, and three fulfillment centers. In addition to the standard postal services, we are offering uh, financial and agent services as well. Talking about our <coughs> CASPO strategy, and, um, and I guess that's the general uh, trend across all national operators, we're trying to switch from being the governmental organization and enter the commercial market uh, by offering, by becoming an integrated financial and the logistic operator, as well as the uh, social partner for the state. When it comes to the social services, we're planning to uh, expand and utilize our existing infrastructure across the country. We want to be a one-stop shop for the digital and non-digital services uh, in the villages and the cities. We want to become the financial agent of the state programs. We want to perform the online education in the villages, and we're going to continue main, uh, providing the uh, normal or standard uh, postal services like payment of pensions, delivery of correspondence and newspapers and magazines to the remote areas. When it comes to becoming an integrated uh, financial and logistic operator, uh, we would like to offer different ways of payment, financial and insurance services, different types of delivery options, again, in response to our customer needs. Uh, we will provide fulfillment services and E2E uh, logistics, and as well as cargo and transit shipments. Talking briefly about financial results, um, and uh, as a confirmation of the success of our strategy, Cuspo has become uh, profitable for the first time in five years this year, actually. Um, for eight months in 2023, we managed to increase our revenue by 44%, reduce our expenses by 14.6%, which allowed us to achieve the profit of 5.2 million versus anticipated loss of 23.1 million. Well, having mentioned about what we're planning to do, I'd like to briefly talk about what we're actually accomplishing so far uh, to execute our uh, strategy. Kazakhstan is a huge country. We have a, a territory of 2.8 million square kilometers. We have 89 cities, 29 uh, towns, and over 6,000 villages. So uh, sticking to our core business, delivering a last mile 
to our customers main, uh, still remains our core, uh, core business. Again, we're continuously improving the quality of service uh, to ensure that we actually deliver on time and all the parcels safely. Uh, in response to our customer demands, we have started to offer the uh, large size parcels delivery utilizing railroad and trucks. Uh, we're using our own uh, warehouse facilities, transportation, to guarantee the safety of the deliveries uh, with 52 delivery and pickup points across the country. Um, again, in response to the uh, general, I guess, industry trends, uh, Cuspos noticed that uh, all major e-com platforms are moving uh, towards the uh, cargo deliveries, which is why we actually set up a special standalone unit with its own transportation warehouses and fully trained uh, custom clearance team to actually uh, provide our customers with the alternative option to the uh, postal deliveries. Again, we have a full support from our government, uh, who are actually very interested in ensuring the speedy and efficient delivery of all parcels, which is why Caspost was appointed as the economic operator, which again allows us to save time and costs on uh, custom clearance. For example, there are no custom duties for the uh, parcels under 1,000 euro and 31 kilograms, and we can actually submit the custom declaration in advance electronically. Again, Kaspost is utilizing Kazakhstan's unique geographical position, uh, which is why we're developing the transit logistics services as well. We have an A-class bonded warehouse right on the border with China, uh, which we're using to facilitate the transit flow from China into Europe and Central Asia. Uh, in addition to our standard logistic business, uh, we're also developing a financial services. Kaspost is lucky enough to have a banking license in Kazakhstan. So we're offering the payment of pension and social welfare. Uh, we issue our bank cards. Uh, we're providing the ATM network coverage, brokerage services. Uh, we're also uh, giving an opportunity for the population to participate in the local IPOs. Uh, we're providing the... Uh, internet acquiring services and corporate bank as well. So, but we're not going to stop there. We want to improve and expand our existing financial services infrastructure so we can actually become a reliable partner for the state and the governmental programs. Well, that's pretty much about us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Namkita, can you tell us a little bit about um, how the economic situation in different countries can impact strategy and especially impact strategy around diversification? Yeah, so from South Africa, my name is Namkita Mona, uh, CEO of the SA Post Office. So from a South African perspective, we've seen how the economic situation of a country affects the strategy that you have to follow as a, as a postal operator. And as I was also looking through this and, and realizing what the challenges that were dealt with, because remember, as postal operators, we are not in, uh, we're not operating in isolation. We operate within the logistics of the country, the economy, um, whether there's electricity, etc. So those have a direct impact on what we do. But also, if you have a country that has largely got a number of poor people, a large number of poor people. It depends on the kind of um, service and products that you have to offer. You can't offer the same everywhere. And if you look at South Africa as well, we, we have a large rural segment and therefore you require specific um, um, you know, services there. And I came across a 2016 study that said there was a direct correlation between a country's GDP per capita and the, what it does in terms of offering the postal services. And they go on and on. I can share that study with you because it was quite relevant. But you'll see when we talk about uh, the post uh, uh, service in South Africa, and I've said that my topic is diversify or die, because that's exactly what we see if we do not diversify and we don't uh, keep up with what the environmental changes are in the markets, we will definitely not be there tomorrow. But I don't think it's a South African phenomenon. I think this is a, a phenomenon everywhere. I'm very pleased to hear that you guys are profitable this year. I wish that would be our story. Uh, so well done. Um, I'm not sure where to press the, green. the big one. 
Thank you. I thought I should just uh, give South Africa at a glance for those who don't quite understand our country. Uh, we have a population of over 62 million people. 50% uh, of these people live within the 17 of the largest metros and municipalities. So that means if you are able to uh, service these people, you've already, you know, kind of won because you've got the other 50% that is largely unbanked and, and quite poor. 61.2% uh, of our population is under 35 years old. So it also means that we need to catch up and be able to digitize and be more futuristic in our approach rather than just uh, work as a traditional uh, postal service. Uh, uh, the average household size is about 3.5 people. And in terms of internet access, there's about 78.9% access, but cell phone access is much higher at 92.1. So meaning that some of these people do have access to a cell phone, but they don't have internet access uh, because of where they are, both in terms of the economy and geographically. Uh, we pay over 27 million social grants and, and this is social grants uh, that are paid to uh, about 20 million people, but the, the other number that says 27 is because someone else could be, uh, could be an old lady looking after, you know, uh, orphans, etc. So the number of grants is proportionally higher than uh, what we pay. So, I mean, that for us is, is a bit of a problem. If these people cannot become your customers in the true sense of the word, that's a problem. Um, I'm not going to talk much about uh, what's on the right hand side, but every Everybody knows what COVID did to us, uh, but also our country is, is uh, struggling with energy issues at this point. Uh, but also the government has taken a decision to say we need to resolve what we call the triple challenges, uh, which mean poverty, unemployment and inequality. And therefore, we need to resolve the energy crisis. We need to contain our public spending. Uh, we must make sure that we advance structural ref reforms and reduce inflation. Now, if I go through to the post office corporate strategy, we've now sat down and said, if for us to continue or at least even uh, survive, we need to move from being a traditional uh, postal operator all the way to be a, becoming an integrated uh, service uh, and, and logistics provider. So for us, that's gonna be very important. Sorry, I can't read my own slides, I'm getting blind. Um, <laughs> So, so what we've also then said is we would need to move uh, and become this modern postal operator. And as we become the postal operator, we need to make sure that the four pillars at the top is what we're focusing on. Enhanced uh, customer experience, optimized um, service delivery, uh, modernized business as well as financially sustainable. So those are the pillars that we're gonna be focusing on. But at the bottom here, we need an, en an enabling environment to ensure that strategically we survive. In the previous um, uh, panel, someone spoke about strategic partnerships. That for us is a strategy of the future. We also realize that we can't do this on our own. We also need other people who can help us, but at the same time, we need to ensure that we change our business. Now, in terms of uh, diversifying our own strategy, we've put down three horizons. One is to optimize the operations and make sure that we protect and sustain the existing revenues. There's not much to talk about there because we really are losing customers hand over fist currently because of exactly what was said earlier, that we, uh, we are no longer competing among ourselves. We are competing, competing with the world, even with our own customers. But we also aim to increase revenue generation so that we can deal with e-commerce and, e and digital services. But in the third horizon, we really want to extend our business capabilities going forward. I thought I should share this with you as part of our what we call the post office of tomorrow. We've got a new strategy that looks to making sure that logistics becomes at the core, uh, partnerships as well. E-commerce is a big issue, the authentication center, but as well as the digital business hubs. But in business hubs, we're not talking about just business hubs. We want to become the one-stop shop for government services in South Africa, where the government itself cannot reach uh, very rural areas. And we want to be able for people to come in and diversify our services way beyond just what we do. We're talking there about small and medium enterprises who would be able to uh, participate and 
um, you know, operate from our, um, our platforms. Um, I know an example in the uh, telco sector in South Africa, one of the cell phone operators has started selling fried chicken on their, on their platform and they've sold so much. And, and basically they're saying, we have the platform, it's working for us in terms of what we wanted to do. How else do you diversify? How else do you open it up and make sure that you go through to everything? So I do think that would be my last slide, but uh, definitely we are moving forward. But I'd like to make a disclaimer at this point. The South African Post Office currently is undergoing what we call under the South African law, business rescue. We went to the um, owner of the South African Post Office, which is the government, and we said to them, because of what we've inherited over the years, because the last time we posted a profit was 2006. So it's been downhill ever since, but we know what we didn't do. We didn't pivot early enough. We didn't digitize. We didn't move with the times. We just sat there and became a traditional postal operator. And we, we then went to the government and said to them, if you assist us and put us under rescue so that we are protected and then we can start building and making sure that we can build a stronger, maybe smaller in the beginning, uh, post office, but stronger and then we can grow organically and go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mariella, say to us first, you, your customer base is something like 100,000. So can you talk to us a little bit about what diversifications op uh, diversification options you have uh, as a smaller post? Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Mariella, CEO of Seychelles Post Offices. I'm new to the world of post offices. I've been there for two and a half years. I am from a retail background. So before I kind of answer the question, I'll give you a bit of um, details on where Seychelles is. I've gone forward. How do I go back? Sorry, Sorry. which one? The red one. Why is it not Other working? Red. Other red one. Green. 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 Ah. It's gone. There we go. Ah. Here we go. Um, obviously, whenever you say Seychelles, everybody thinks of the, the holiday place. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of give you the kind of the geographical position of Seychelles and probably will explain later why we think it's important in the world of logistics and diversification. So obviously, we are a very small place, 115 islands, probably the smallest country in Africa, one of the smallest in the world. And in terms of our main island, Mahé, it's, it's very small. So you can drive from one end to the other in probably a couple of hours. <laughs> and um, we have uh, only uh, five post offices, but we're actually opening another one because we see the potential there. And obviously the post office that we, we've inherited, the building that we're in is something that dates back to the 1860s. <laughs> so it's pretty old, so you can imagine. So in terms of what we are doing to go forward to diversify our business is digitalization. Obviously, like the lady from South Africa said, we've inherited a post office which hasn't really changed over the years. And now suddenly we have um, a customer base which has changed, we understands technology, e-commerce and everything. And as the post, we have to catch up. And the catching up is you have to do it now or else you die. <laughs> and obviously in doing that, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of public awareness as well, and a lot of education. So in terms of digitalization, we are looking to um, integrate our systems, connect with external companies, um, build a new website with the UPU team at DotPost, and also work with some of the external partners here, the wider sector postal partners of the UPU, to offer direct-to-consumer marketing via the post. Now, in terms of Seychelles, because we're such a small place, we don't have very much of a retail existence. So, E-commerce is one of the biggest things to us. Pretty much everything is imported, whether it's food or drink or clothing, everything's imported. So there is a huge potential for us in e-commerce. And as the post, we want to use our platform to connect the people of Seychelles with the e-commerce providers out there. And also to increase our outbound e-commerce because we realize Seychelles as a tourist lo uh, location has a lot to offer in terms of local products which we can sell online to the rest of the world. And those products are probably not interested to the local market, but they are inter interest interesting to the international market. And in doing that, we will help the smaller, medium so, you know, enterprises locally. And in terms of logistics, and I want to separate logistics from e-commerce, mm -hmm. 
Our government is actually supporting us to build a new IMPC, which will be airside, a lot bigger than what we have now. Um, currently, we work in a very small space, which is 20 square meters, <laughs> and it's going to go up to 500 square meters, and we have the chance to offer transit mail operations to the rest of the region, which is Africa, Middle East, and you're working with the Asian um, continent. In Seychelles, uh, delivery hasn't really been a thing recently because we don't have a national addressing system. So it was traditionally that you came to the post to collect your items, and now we have been working with the government and customs to allow for last mile deliveries. We've started doing this with um, EMS, and now we're going to do it all parcels and small packets. And it's something that we see the customer is really asking for, and obviously the private sector e-commerce partners we're working with are asking for this to happen. And customers in Seychelles are very internet savvy and they are way ahead of the post, so we have to do all these things to be able to catch up with them. And the um, national addressing system is something that the government of Seychelles is driving as well because it realizes it's got a, a population that is spending a lot of money but has a, doesn't have a digital connectivity to the world in terms of who they are, where they are, and also it's part of the whole awareness of how digital economy and technology works. When we talk about the e-services that we're working on, obviously we're working with custom Seychelles for the clients to be able to pay their customs taxes and duties before it gets to the country, because that is a big problem for us. Items arrive, then you've got to do all the customs forms and all the, the filling of forms. You have to go to this place and that place, and obviously that for the customer is not ideal, and obviously the amount of time things take in customs is not ideal for the partners we work with. So this is something that we've managed to well, work with our customs partners who actually see the benefit in doing that. And recently, they've allowed us to do the last mile deliveries. They no longer open your packet at the post office in front of everybody, which is a big step forward for us, and they pre-clear all items. And our last um, uh, point, if you like, is we are from, we're having a retail background. I see the post office as a retailer. And obviously in Seychelles, because we have a big uh, tourism industry, we actually have a, a souvenir and gift shop in the post office where we also sell a lot of stamps. So philately is a big important thing to us. And we are working again with um, other wider sector postal partners here to launch our first digital stamp, which hopefully will be early next year. We're working with private sector to also have a pop-up cafe outside the post office because obviously it's a high footfall with tourism and also develop postal branded products. So these are the things that we're trying to do to not fully rely on purely the mail. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I forgot I had another slide with an awful lot of um, statistics on just to show how um, in Seychelles, you know, how much we, how the population is connected to the internet how much money they spend online, and for a small population, actually have a quite a big e-commerce power. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was me, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Nermeen, um, can you talk to us a little bit about diversification strategy and what are the, the key factors that a post um, should possess when it comes to, to having uh, an impactful diversification strategy? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, let me tell you first about Egypt Post and uh, how it established and how it started, actually, because Egypt Post started with a lot of diversification uh, already uh, when it started on uh, the 19th century. Um, uh, I know Egypt is, is, is the first country in the world that make a mail system, a uh, regu uh, regular mail system, but um, Egypt Post was uh, started uh, its establishment in 1865. And it was fascinating how it was uh, having this diversification of products, not only about mail, uh, letter, or parcel, uh, transportation and delivery. Um, in 2016, we discovered that we need to go back to diversification again. Uh, why it's happening? Because the perspective of diversification, uh, we have seen uh, that the optimum utilization of the postal network. Uh, we have 4,300 post offices all across Egypt. Uh, it's all connected. Uh, we provide postal services and financial services. And these are the traditional way we offer products. 
we find out that with the declining of letter mail and uh, the financial service of saving accounts, not bringing any new customers, actually we are losing. So we have to take a look on the market hours, uh, around us and see what are the emerging uh, corporates and making big names. It's like utility, uh, bill payment, uh, uh, engine, uh, uh, last mile delivery with some better, better customer experience and a quicker road. Uh, the government entities around us establishing their own portal to allow submit uh, the request online. And there have been each entity around us is making their own approaches of uh, developing uh, uh, their products and the ways you offer their service to citizen other than using the traditional postal service. So what happened that we have, uh, you know, the 3D postal concept was like uh, more than 10 years ago was emerging on the UPU. So we have to take a look at this concept and we started to uh, make a customer tailored service. It mean bring financial service with postal service combined together and allow any entity to uh, offer their products to, at the post office. So the whole idea is about we define the parcel, the sender and recipient. So what will happen? We will define the citizen. So it's data captured and transmitted to third party. And this is like e-administrative service. I believe the next slide will make it more. So before we have mail deposit and mail delivery and cash collection, deposit and disperse. After moving from these traditional services to integrated product uh, and customer tailor services, which are we combine together, first of all, data capture and transmission to the third party, document collection plus delivery plus cash collection for third party. We just combine these two things together and make it integrated. The other ones make parcel deposit. This is especially for SMEs and e-commerce. Um, you might have the ability to build your own marketplace and to make a payment gateway. Some SMEs will never have that chance to even uh, list themselves on marketplace, but they can sell their products on WhatsApp or Facebook or any digital way. So they will require simply someone to collect the cash on their behalf and put it in their account that what Asia Post has developed. So we have addressed the need, we make screening on the market and see how we can address uh, these needs. And this slide can tell you before and after uh, this is the balance, account balance gross uh, from uh, 2000 uh, and uh, I believe 10. Uh, this is what we started the uh, digitalization of our financial services. And uh, from 2014, this is the digitalization, the, the digitalization completed. In 2015, we started the diversification. You can see the gross. And it's just uh, saving account and current accounts with interest, that's all. And then we have listed all of this. As, uh, as accounts managed by each post. Also, this show you uh, the number of transactions of cash collection for third party. Uh, we started in 2016. Uh, it was stable for three years, and then you can see maybe more than 100% gross for the previous years. And this is the amount of cash collection by billions also. And with the gross of this uh, data capture of the citizen, cash collection for third party, maybe document collection as well, there was a need to make a refund for the citizen. So we developed a new service, a new product to make the refund for the citizen. And this shows you the number of transactions across uh, uh, starting from 2016 until 20, uh, 2023. So we started, uh, you know, on 2015 with these products and we are here. All these entities now use Asia Post as their own contact, human contact points of offering their product to the, uh, to the citizen. How we can do this? First of all, you need to define what are the needs. Second one, have your own system and your own team. Sometimes we have been asked to develop a service within less than a week. So, or maybe a reliable technology provider, but he has to be your partner. Because the idea of making a proof of concept and a use case, and then we will shake and make a presentation, and this is, will not count. You need to be super fast to address the needs. Also, quality and standardization of a process. Now we offer more than 170 service. Imagine if you bring the staff all over the 4,300 post office and train them every month. This is impossible. So what happened? We follow one standard, a standard process. 
even there is a box for business rules for the entity. So all the, our colleagues in the post office he just collect the entity and then the service, and he sees the business rule and what is required, and the system guide him about what to do. This was very important, it was a big challenge for my colleagues uh, for quality when they developed this. It was training the whole staff, more than 20,000, in one year. They keep training them about the new concept of e-post and e-administration, how to capture the data, how to make the good quality data capturing, and how to process this. When it happened for the first service, it just needs a circular to be published, a detailed circular to guide them how to provide the service. And you can provide a new service like every week to every month. So it's, it was very important to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on some of the themes that we've talked about here. So Namkita, you mentioned that what happens in a country impacts uh, the post and, and what people need and what kind of services are provided. Um, and we talked a little bit about social services as well. Um, how important do you think it is when you're looking at diversification strategy to, to use the postal infrastructure or to, to build something completely new? And kind of where is your vision in that moving forward? And do you see it being balanced one way or the other or one taking precedent over the other? Yeah, so from a South African perspective, we've had um, what we call the infrastructure has always been our biggest strength because it didn't matter where you went in the country, a small little town, the big cities, the rural areas, there was always a post office. So that has always been one of our uh, advantages from, from anything that we do. However, uh, what we are now saying in terms of what we've just said, you do not need to, I mean, I'm also, uh, I joined in April 2021, so I'm also just two and a half years in the business. And uh, coming in with fresh eyes, you can see things that could have been done differently and done better. One of which was, we did not need to have the same uh, bricks and mortar, big office, 12 tailors, everywhere in the country. You do need to, to uh, segment your markets. And in other markets, you sell certain services like we do motor vehicle licensing, and it's one of our better moving products. But in other areas, all you need is a point of presence where you'll have like a kiosk and the old ladies must come and get their social grant, maybe also get their medicines delivered, etc. So we are now beginning to look at the country and segmenting everything to say, how is it that we can serve the customer? So you may not have so many bricks and mortar, but you will see us in many, many, many more places. we filling stations for garages um, where people converge, but also, uh, which we think is much more important, is becoming this hub for government services so that people can do all these other government uh, services within a post office. It brings all the feet through, but it also is a service to the, the people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else wants to comment on that as well, as far as diversification strategy, uh, you know, mainly thinking about the postal infrastructure and how to leverage it versus kind of mm -hmm. starting from a clean slate with providing a completely new product or service. Okay. Uh, actually, there is two types of diversification. One is not easy, but it's can done uh, in very uh, close time, which is horizontal one. It's find your core business, mm. what you are best at, and try to integrate them and bring something new for your current customer and to attract more. The other one is a little bit hard if you can bring um, uh, a quite new business to complement your roles, which is, for example, marketplace. There is a lot of attempts from both operators to develop their own marketplace. It's not easy to, to build, a, this technology is easy, as Ivana said, from Slovenia. It is not the whole, it's not the magical one. You can have the best marketplace ever. But it requires a new know-how, different know-how, knowledge from our uh, capacities. Um, this relations of listing merchants and making products, bring the best prices, you know. They even sometimes sell the products less than the, the original vendor, uh, the, the, the producer of, of the product. How they can do this? It's not easy, actually. Um, it will be, of course, uh, a volume generating for us if we manage to do such a thing. So as, as the, the, now they control the whole ecosystem, the end, the end process, uh, 
they are now affecting our industry. So I believe uh, this is a hard type of uh, diversification, which is very important to have. And maybe the UPU, maybe the dream of the UPU is having this huge marketplace <laughs> developed by UPU and uh, enable the SMEs uh, to list themselves and show the products, maybe. Maybe this is a new step uh, to compete with our competitors now. Mm. Okay, thank you. And uh, speaking of the UPU, I mean, as members, it would be great to hear from you as well, um, how you see the UPU, uh, how it could support its members in uh, their diversification efforts. So balancing this need of providing your USO to, to offering and reinventing yourselves as well and the kind of services you provide to your citizens. And also, if anyone in the audience has any ideas on this topic, too. Um, yes, here. Can we get a mic on this side? <laughs> Our mic runners, runners are at lunch. <laughs> Is it on? Yes. Hi, uh, Graham B. Um, I, um, in, in terms of diversification, what, what role can the UPU play? I'm not sure, that's, that's a good question, but should the UPU have a role in diversifying? Is that, is that really what the UPU is about? Uh, because surely the UPU is there to ensure um, that, that mail is provided between, um, uh, between countries. So on some of, some of the diversifications that you're talking about, financial services, is it really anything to do with the UPU? I, I personally don't think so. Uh, and some of the other things, such as um, social payments that are happening within post offices domestically. That's a very domestic service. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the UPU. So I think, I think many countries maybe have too high expectations of what the UPU can do on some of their diversification. Yeah. You go first. Uh, actually, uh, Asia Post have learned how to div di div make the diversification through the UPU. It was the uh, UPU when I ha we have seen the e and the administration services and list of e-services and how we can develop this. So it was the UPU who bring us the uh, know-how to do it. So it's not only about uh, the regulation and standards, it's also about international cooperation of mail, uh, exchange expertise uh, among all the nations. You know, It's not only about the industrial countries and they are leading the digitalization and innovation. But also there could be a developing country, so have a good idea that address the need of its citizen. So the big industrial country can even benefit from this. So in UPU is more, it's, it's, it's much more than uh, male regulation and standardization. It's a place when we come together and learn from each other. So actually Egypt is one of the countries that benefit a lot, maybe, maybe than 80% of our idea how to adopt to diversification, how to develop this, what we need have been identified uh, through our participation in the UPU. Yeah, so I think um, as a start, because we are all, we have a, a crisis of relevance as post offices, or it's developing in generally many, many countries. And I don't see how the UPU would then be immune to that problem. You know, so if we as postal operators have an issue with how relevant can we stay, how do we keep ourselves afloat, how do we stay, you know, relevant in markets that are, you know, there's disruptors everywhere. There has to be a question around what is it that the UPU can do uh, for itself first to stay relevant, but also to help us. So if I were to answer the question directly, I would think about how the UPU should start thinking about developing a capability, uh, you know, matrix of sorts or, or, or database and, and help us uh, to say a framework rather, which can be a framework that can be used uh, internationally. But if I take it to South Africa, I then make sure that I tailor make it to my local needs. But in terms of standardization and the information that we get, we all can tap into that because there are resources that the UPU can, can, can give us uh, in terms of research, etc. So I do think there's a role for UPU. We're not 
not necessarily saying they must do the work for us, but they must make sure that they build this capability framework or best practice framework. Take the top 20 uh, postal operators in the world and say, how, wh what is Switzerland doing uh, in this segment? Uh, what are they doing well? And this one and that one, and then we all can kind of, um, you know, replicate as far as it can work in our, in our country. So I do think there is, but also just the last point is around they can assist in policy formulation as well. And as far as the postal union is, con is concerned, and then the role is strategic, of course, it's not just about them operating for us. So there's definitely a role uh, that they can play. And also looking at new um, offerings, what else can we do as post offices other than just the traditional uh, postal work that we've been doing? They need to be the leading people to come and say, hey, this is what's happening in other countries. Have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? Thank you. Did you have something? I, mean, I kind of agree with that. I think the UPU provides the, the platform for all the postal operators to unite together. Yes. And obviously then provides the information of what's going on in other parts of the world. And I think in postal uh, jurisdictions like ours, in our part of the world, the UPU is the strategy that the government will listen to as well. Mm. So it provides that framework for governments to see what's happening out elsewhere. Mm. Because I think governments, if they were left to their own devices, probably wouldn't think the post is more of a local thing rather than a global thing. And the UPU together with the wider postal sector give the small posts like Seychelles the opportunity to tap into other things that you would not order other, you know, otherwise have been able to. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the network effect and being able to connect yeah. with other posts and learn about what others are doing and have a platform yeah. for that is, is really important. In, in, in yeah. your From my perspective on the international business side, probably it'd be great if UPU can act as the facilitator or moderator mm -hmm. when it comes to the conversation with the major e mm -hmm. So basically, we all know that we're losing the flow to the commercial cargo, but again, there's got to be an option that postal operators can do something utilizing existing infrastructure, asset base. So what can we do as the postal operators to bring back the volume? Mm -hmm. And this is the conversation somebody has to establish. UPU representing, what, 192 countries. So that's a strong voice. Mm -hmm. So tell us what we can do to bring the volume back to service the customers as, as, as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to add to that question? Uh, Here. Uh, uh, Charles, go ahead. Yeah. Or Kate. No. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Do we have any mics? I have a mic here. I have a question. Oh, hi. Okay. Yeah. Oh, my turn? Okay. Uh, Sam Brangman, Bermuda Post, Postmaster General. I have one quick question. As a post office that's either a government department or a government funded that's trying to innovate and grow for sustainability and to survive, how do you manage the concept of competition? In other words, in Bermuda, we are trying to diversify, we're trying to grow our e-commerce business, but where we have complaints from local couriers that say that as a government department, we shouldn't, we shouldn't compete. So my question is, how do you handle the concept or what strategy do you use regarding competition? Good question. We have an example like that in South Africa, where because we we are not fully funded by government. And because our country is as rural as it is, and they, we have this mandate to ensure that everyone in the country has access to postal services. Then the country then went to our regulator and the regulator then, um, we, they, they call it a protected area. So we, we can, we, we're the only ones who are supposed to be delivering anything from zero to one kilogram. So it is our own uh, designated area. But about 20 years ago, uh, we were not doing it as well as we should. And the courier companies came in and they started eating our lunch um, since then. And now they are, we are all in court with that because they're saying we want to create a monopoly for a post office that is ineffective, that is not working. And uh, so that case is still a case that is being fought. But it is true. I mean, there's competition issues, uh, whether we can force them to do it, but how we, from a post office perspective, are dealing with it, we're saying to them, uh, it's either you, you, you pay or play, in the sense that 
in the rural areas, nobody wants to go there. It's too far, it's expensive, etc. So they, they want to cherry pick and do the, the, the urban areas and, and the big cities. And they leave the difficult and expensive work to us. So we're saying it's fine. If you want to do that, it's either you pay us a fee to, for, for us to be able to do this, or you, you go, you take your, your cargo yourself there. But it was still, I mean, we haven't resolved it at this point. It's still a major issue. Uh, like I say, it's still in court, but it's something that we need to resolve because they can't just do the cherry picking and then leave us to do the, the dirty work, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, in addition to uh, Ms. Pekita said, actually, I agree with her, but also there is a very important concept that we need to recognize here. First, how the government defines the designated operator in the country is very important. Mm -hmm. You are designated to provide a universal service obligation and it is defined in the national regulation of the country. So the government is committed to offer all across the country basic service with good quality at affordable rates. So it is the government who will define the scope of universal service obligation and how to make it. And there is a balance, as Ms. Makita said, that uh, you can define. There is a lot of best practice about pay or play. And also, the service offering, you know, the entities related to the quality of service, the product developments, are away from the government and the regulations. They're focused on the market. So you are successful once you see the market and you compete with them. And making a government entity is not like you have a police officer say you have to go to this entity because it's government. No. The citizen and the customer are free to choose. But when you are located all over around them and you are you offering it a good quality of service and much lower rates, why mm. you will go to others? Actually, during COVID, uh, we have faced a stop of air flights and social media. There was uh, screams. Where is your post? Why, you know, this private company has taken this amount just to ship this little mail item to this country? Where is your post? Because we were uh, stopped immediately because we have uh, heavily dependent on the air flight passenger, not the cargo. You're not familiar with, with the cargo transportation. So our operation stopped like for three months. So people on social media was screaming because there was a miss. Uh, use of this bad situation that the whole world was in, and the project was very expensive doing this. So um, there is nothing at all contradiction about being a government mm. and uh, make the customer needs because being a government is has to do with the universal obligation. It mm. does, has nothing to do with the way you offer your products. It's it's not. Uh, I believe it's not uh, affected by each other. Great. And uh, I have a question over here, Charles. Yes. One, two. Okay, so uh, Charles from Price Malaysia, nice to see you. What a great panel, by the way, I really enjoyed it. Um, I do have one, co one comment and then a question. My comment is, I'm very unhappy that South Africa beat England last weekend. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, get that on record before we go any further. But I will be wearing my Bokka shirt on Saturday when I go and watch them, so good luck. Anyway, um, my question actually was to Semyon. So, uh, Semyon, your, your profit turnaround is really quite impressive. Unfortunately, you didn't get a chance to, to talk a little bit about how, and whether it was diversification or something, or was it cost down? So I'd love just to have a few minutes I could on what delivered that incredible yeah. turnaround. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, well, basically, that's a combination of two. Uh, and again, that's related to the previous question, whether uh, Post, as a national operator, should compete with the inner open market. I think we do have to do that. We have the asset base, which we have to maximize in terms of uh, revenue we're earning uh, per square meter or per kilometer or whatever you call it. And again, we have to be very commercial. We have to look at the expenses that we incur. We have a huge amount of employees, which we have to look after. We have the uh, infrastructure. We have uh, the tools and equipments, again, which require the modernization. And um, again, that, that needs to change. And this is what's actually happening with us. We started looking at the numbers. We started looking at our expense. We drilled down to the expenses. Do we actually need that? Do we have to modernize that? Can we switch it to uh, IT solutions? Can we find a better and efficient use of, for example, our post offices? So yes, it is a combination of two. We're trying to diversify. We're trying to utilize our asset base as efficient as possible. And we're also looking after our costs. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, Sid Hart from the Asia Pacific Post Cooperative. Uh, a couple of comments rather than questions, but both, both based, uh, based on this panel and, and the previous one. I think um, someone in the audience said, uh, you know, were these things actually in the UPU's remit, but should the UPU be responsible for them? I think the bigger question when it comes to whether it be the UPU or cooperatives like our own and IPC is what's our purpose in the postal world that we have today? Certainly within the cooperative, we've completely changed our tack on how we support members. Our focus now is purely on how we help the members to bring new product, new revenue streams online, and frankly, not being blindly positive about the market we're in any longer. So asking the big, somewhat uncomfortable questions a lot of the time about our relevance and where we stand against our, our, our competitors. Part of that is the, the question around regulation and what that regulation does for us. So for many years, it's given us a privileged position in the market. Yeah. It's enabled us to get goods in and out of country quickly. We've had, in some cases, a pure monopoly on movement. And that now has actually turned around. It's become on often, certainly across Asia and the Pacific, where most of our posts are still highly regulated, uh, a noose around the neck rather than an enabler. So there is a, there's a, a part to be played by the UPU and cooperatives in um, opening up our, our viewpoint on the world and how it is today. There's a part to be played in having those tough conversations with regulators and governments and the operators on how those regulations are either implied fairly across the market so that our competitors are facing the same restraints and restrictions that we are, or they are reduced so that we all have an open market to play in. The big part that I would I'd point to with that, and someone mentioned cherry picking earlier, in a number of our countries, we've got some of the most highly island-based countries in the, in, in the world, in Asia and the Pacific. The likes of Ninja Van and similar competitors will be giving upwards of 20% of their volume back to the post because they cannot have the reach and depth of reach that we have a, as an industry. And yet they're still driving down our pricing. They're giving us unprofitable volume that we have to deliver because we have an obligation. So I think the question on UPU relevance on this, the question on cooperative relevance for me, of course, is whether we, is not whether we have a place in that conversation and in the modern postal world. It's more about what our obligation is to move quickly and with clarity of vision. That's my comment. Any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Siva Somasundram, I'm from the UPU, and I thought I might share some thoughts on uh, what the role of the UPU is, at least from the perspective of the sec Secretariat's concerned, and been party to many discussions on, on this. Um, I think it's really important first to stress the fact that the agency is an intergovernmental agency. So it is a treaty-based organization where member states are engaged in making sure that we have the appropriate rules to allow for the exchange of mail. Uh, and as Namin from Egypt Post uh, pointed out, a critical focus of governments is uh, ensuring the universal service provision. Um, and so discussions around diversification, profitability, and all of that is really sort of connected to the idea that there are challenges with ensuring the universal service provision, and how do we actually make sure that designated operators are still in a position to be able to sustainably provide for the universal service provision. Um, and so in terms of the work that we do at the, uh, at the UPU and the International Bureau, there's, there's two things. One is there is a focus on supporting member states in developing the rules and treaties that are needed to facilitate the exchange of international mail um, and other things that are sort of related to the post. Um, but there's also a very significant focus on knowledge sharing and best practices. And, and this is where um, there are opportunities to talk about diversification strategies. Uh, it's also where there are opportunities for us to help designated operators in their conversations with governments, because not all governments quite understand what uh, the postal network can bring to the table. Um, in terms of financial services, financial inclusion, social inclusion, and, and there's a whole gamut of it. If we are to take ourselves from the narrow box of thinking of the post as a, an agent of delivering 
just parcels and, and letters, but see it purely as a, an agnostic physical network, which at the end of the day has a person who's delivering something, I think the world uh, could potentially be your oyster. Uh, and this is really quite important because um, the, the pandemic, for example, actually underscored this. Uh, when governments needed someone to deliver social payments, when governments needed someone to deliver um, health products, uh, someone to deliver um, um, fresh produce, uh, it was the postman in many countries. And, and we've done studies on this and have actually published examples of all of the work that post offices did across the world during the pandemic. But the point I'm trying to make is this. Uh, diversification per se, it's, it's certainly about profitability, trying to increase your uh, opportunities to be able to sustain your business models, for sure. Uh, but as a designated operator, I think the conversation is really about saying, we can do a whole range of other things as well, um, because as, uh, and, and in our conversations with you as governments, uh, we want to bring this to your attention so that you can support us uh, in our journey as well. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think these are some of the points that uh, we, uh, we, we do debate and discuss in the UPU. And the relevance of the UP is very much attached to those two things, uh, treaty making, knowledge sharing, and best practice sharing. And it's, it's a bit unfortunate that, you know, at the reason extra in Congress in Riyadh, uh, there were a number of proposals seeking to actually gain resourcing in order to build knowledge bases. Um, unfortunately, member states didn't approve those uh, changes. Um, and, and as a result, we're now in a, in a mode where we're seeking funding in order to be able to do that work. So um, I, I think it's also important for member states to recognize, as the panelists did today, uh, there is a fair amount of good work that comes out of the UPU in terms of um, uh, best practice sharing, knowledge sharing, uh, and that's not necessarily for the bigger poor. It's actually for the smaller players, for the developing countries and the least developed countries. And without proper funding across the membership, it's near impossible to achieve. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, I want to, to, to make a comment on said hard point about the regulations. I believe balance, uh, regulation is all about balance. And yes, the universe is in a balance. And when the human beings are making so much carbon emissions and we affected this balance, we are seeing severe consequences on this. So the regulation is not matured and not balanced. That will cause a destruction for the sectors they are about. Let's be honest here and, and, and open and transparent as well. The government state has to define what is required and what they're going to achieve to the citizen. And they need to do so from all the perspective, from opening market, regulating market. And there is a very important point when we're relating to regulations, for example. In the previous panels, there have been the free shipping policy. Just Google on free shipping, you will find the way you do it. They're telling them, you calculate the shipping charges and you distribute it on the products and you just put the margin and then <laughs> it's illusion. <laughs> They're telling them how to deceive the customer. Where are the regulators in such a thing? There are bad practices about monopolization for the e-commerce. They offer free shipping for only the products provided by them. This is a monopolization. This is not a monopolization by law. It's a monopolization by need. So where are the competition protection here? Where are the regulators here? They are not in the place. So they need to keep monitoring on the whole situation on this. And getting the point of, of, of Siva said about the best practice sharing and knowledge sharing, this is very important actually. And about the principle of funding and, and resources, I believe the postal network is the best resources. In this room, we have uh, Ivana. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I loved it. I was texting after you and just, customer, you know, I, I can show you. <laughs> I take notes. It's important. So this is an expertise that have taught me in just a uh, few minutes. Perspective, I need to pay attention. I even send it to my colleagues in Egypt now. You know, we need to address, we need to focus on this area. So I believe the postal network has plenty of expertise. We just need to find the mechanism and methodology because we understand each other much better than anyone else. 
So we just need to cooperate more and more and uh, work together more and more and cooperate and make this postal network more integrated and, and more united. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing I want to follow up on is uh, looking more forward in the next five to ten years. So we heard a lot about uh, your strategy so far and uh, ways you've diversified with providing more government services to citizens, financial services, uh, more services along the e-commerce supply chain. But are there other products and services uh, that you've identified where, where you see yourself in that market in the future that you would want to experiment with? You know, that we haven't discussed already this morning. Um, be great to hear some of your ideas and uh, where, what you're thinking for the future. Well, for us in Kazakhstan, similar to Saudi Arabia, we are inbound market. So we will be focusing on the international e-commerce, trying to bring as much volume into the country as possible, whether it's going to be cargo, postal, transit. So anything we can do to increase the volume. That's main focus for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we're in a similar situation as well. It's all about inbound e-commerce. We can increase our outbound e-commerce, but it's very minimal. Mm. Obviously, we're a very small country, and the tourism market is the market we want to capture. And that's where probably helping the small companies come into play, and also changing some of the parts of the post office into retail, branded products, and because the post office is a brand mm. that, in the, in the context of Seychelles, can be sold to the customer. Yeah. yeah. And anyone from the audience, I know we have a lot of posts represented here today. If, uh, if you want to share any diversification uh, efforts or strategies or products or services that you've seen successful or that you're, you're looking towards in the future, I mean, feel, feel, feel free to chime in as well. We have the strategy session on this later too, so um, don't be shy. Share what you're doing and, and ask questions as well to our panelists. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to keep us from lunch. We're right at 12.30, so I think uh, I'll um, not uh, have anyone dislike me today. And uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your strategies with us this morning. And uh, we have a lunch break, everyone. We're coming back here at two. Uh, we'll talk about uh, logistics and e-commerce again and more diving into tangible strategies for that. Uh, so hope to see you back here at two. And thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.